it's at times like this uh, when I realize the unique challenges of communicating in this method as opposed to in person with a group of people, a church, a class. When I start with an image like this, typically I would say, does anybody here not know who this is? I can do that anyway. Does anyone here not know who this is? It just doesn't have quite the same feel to it. I can only guess. For those of you who may not uh, know this person, this is Warren Buffett. He's not the richest person on the planet, but I think it's safe to say he is the oldest rich person on the planet, worth, you know, $100 billion. An interesting thing about Warren Buffett, um, he's a pretty simple man. He he's, he's lives in the same house that he's lived in for, you know, 50 years. Uh, he doesn't live a lavish lifestyle like many of his, his peer group. Is in reading about him in preparation for today's message, is that I read that uh, he got interested in investments at a very young age. When he saw back in his days that if you put so much money into a savings account that was drawing X percentage uh, percent interest, that may not have seemed like a whole lot in one year's time. I mean, $3 on a $100 investment didn't seem a whole lot. But then he, he realized that interest compounded, that that 3% this year would be, it may be 3% next year, but it would rec represent more money. And if you kept that for 10 years without adding to it and for 20 years and 30 years, and uh, so he got interested in the concept of making money by an investment, and I read that he made his first investment when he was 11 years old, filed his first income tax return when he was, when he was just 14. But it was in, in reading a recent article about him, I don't know if it was in Fortune magazine, sort of shows the eclectic nature of my reading, uh, I, I came across an interesting quote that I found appropriate for setting up today's message. But before I get to the one that I'm interested in, I, I, I did a search on quotes by Warren Buffett, and I found a couple that were sort of interesting and sort of entertaining too. <clears throat> he said this, The best thing that happens to us is when a great company gets into temporary trouble. We want to buy them when they're on the operating table. Uh, a good, sound investment strategy. You don't buy a company when they're healthy, doing well at the top. You buy them when they're struggling, gasping for breath, but have the potential for life. Uh, another quote that's more in keeping with sort of setting up today's message or its theme, he writes this because it, this is a reflection of his sort of his strategy of investment. Because there are a lot of people that uh, in the last, uh, you know, 20 years have moved into to day trading. They own a, a, an account, they can go and they can move their money around at, at the click of a, of a mouse button. And there's some people who've done quite well, made a lot of money, but uh, Warren Buffett th doesn't think that's a smart investment strategy. So he said this, he said, if you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. Now see, for most of us, that's hard. Uh, when we think about m money and, and making money in stocks or investments, we want a quick return, a rapid return. And when the, well, the volatility of the market going up and down, we want to, you know, we want to make the most while we can. And, and I, I did, the, the quote that I saw that sort of set up today's message was one that actually from, from 20 years ago. Uh, at the at the height of the the uh, dot com boom when millionaires were made overnight that um, that so it was about two thousand where Buffett wrote or said this he said they know that overstaying the festivities that is continuing to speculate in companies that have gigantic valuations relative to the cash that they are likely to generate in the future will eventually bring on pumpkins and mice, but they nevertheless hate to miss a single minute of what is one hell of a party. Therefore the giddy participants all plan to leave just seconds before midnight. There's a problem though. They're dancing in a room in which the clocks have no hands. Uh, some of that language may have been lost on you, but, but, but I got it. He talked about that person who is, who is speculating, playing a guessing game on their investment, 
And like Cinderella, realizing that they have to leave the ball at midnight, or the carriage turns back into a pumpkin, and the stallions turn back into mice. What, uh, what Warren refers to there is, um, uh, is, is what I want to think about is, is a gap in the process. His idea is long-term strategy so that the, the tides of, of company values and what the market does, the ups and downs and ups and downs, he just said you don't spend a guessing game. He said everybody likes to be at the top and they like to jump off before it goes to the bottom, but he said it's, very, it's a very risky way. It's not, it's not a sure way to, to do well in the market. You know, I, I thought about him and I thought about this quote in respect to most of us, and, and this is one of those places where our study in Acts actually um, serves both purposes in talking about a challenge for, for individuals personally in the spiritual journey, but, but also for churches, for corporate bodies of believers that, that share this journey. Because we know, um, if you're a realist, is that, that life is, is, is just like that. It, it's almost like a roller coaster. And while there are some that believe that it's God's will for us to simply live on the, the, the high life all of the time, you, you can't support that in Scripture and you certainly can't support it in, in reality. And so while we want to talk about the good times, we say they exist. If you trust God, if you believe, if you pray, if you do all the right kind of things, you're going to have God's best for you. You're going to experience His promises. Um, you're going to be prepared for, for what is next. But the truth of the matter is that we have those seasons, those periods between the last high and the next high that is in fact a gap or it seems to us as a gap in the spiritual journey. And if, and if an investment advisor or investor like uh, Warren Buffett would say, listen, just stay the course. What goes down must come back up. If you're wise in what you do in your strategies, it will work out just fine. As I was reading and preparing for this installation and in our study in the book of Acts, this is what I realized about this particular text. That um, I admitted to you last week as we began this journey in Acts is that I didn't start with a prescription about the subject or the issues and the matters that I want to talk about. I just wanted to look at the text and say, well, what is it saying that may be of value or relevance to us? I, I preached through this passage, I don't know how many times in 40-something years, but for the first time this is what I saw. It doesn't mean it's a new interpretation. It just means on my part, given the givens in life, um, it's a new perspective on what is said there because, uh, because we are, we're, we're in a gap in our, in our nation. We know that, that marriages have gaps between the good times and the not so good times, that raising children have gaps between the, the fun times and the not so fun times. Um, we know that, that churches have seasons when things are going well and when, when things aren't going well, there are gaps in there. And, um, and, and here we are in 2020 living the year of COVID, the, the insane year of COVID. I don't know anybody that's having fun in, in this season. But we know that, that a gap doesn't represent necessarily what is supposed to be normative, and yet it is because it's part of the cycle of life. Where some of you that are uh, watching this, listening to this, are, are in parts of the country that, that churches now since March have not been able to gather for in-person worship. You're not going to tell me that you personally are in a spiritual gap season or that your church is not in a spiritual gap season. And sadly enough, many churches will not survive to the end of this season. There are some churches that are being attempted to put out of business, John MacArthur's Church in California, and we don't have time to, to go into that. So what I want to, I want to talk about is, is, is how you actually live in these gaps based on what the text has to say for us. And given the fact that when I, when I create these videos and edit these things and post these things, I realize in recent weeks we've been pressing an hour, pushing on an hour. And, uh, it, and that may not bother you, but it sort of bothers me because I want to steward your time and our time together. So just know that we have a lot of material to cover. And if, as I'm trying to monitor the time, if it looks like it's going to get away from us, we'll just find a happy uh, stopping point, wind things down at that point, and we will pick up next week where we left off. So having said that, let's, let's move into talking about what it means to, uh, to, to live in the gaps. Based on this passage in Acts chapter 
one. First, this this is this is a tough one for this is a tough one for me. I admit this to you. Those of you who know me well, go ahead and get the laughter out of your system. But it means by owning by owning your mistakes. Living in the gaps, you start by owning your mistakes. All right, let's let's read in Acts chapter one verse nine. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up, and while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. If you were with us last week, uh, you recall that we began this journey in the book of Acts by reading the first few verses. It's that scene in the life of Jesus, when after his, his crucifixion and his resurrection, um, his encountering his disciples further prepare them for what is ahead, that he takes them out to the Mount of Olives, that place where um, he is going to wrap up this season of his ministry, and he has some final words of instructions to them. And we're not going to rehash the material from last week, uh, but we need to say when the time came for for that season to conclude, the scripture simply said that Jesus ascended into heaven. And uh, one of the, the most helpful things for me to do in, in trying to understand scripture is to try to imagine what the people who were there must have been thinking. So you have, you have the, the disciples who are there. Um, based on the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when it said that, that after the resurrection of Jesus, there were, there were over 500 people who saw him at one time. And the scholars can debate exactly when that took place. Um, I want to believe that this is actually where, where that happened. That, you know, they're wondering what's next, and they're with him on that occasion. They walk out of the city, and they walk to the Mount of Olives. And... Um, and there he ascends. And what must they have been thinking? And so this is what my imagination does with this. You have, you have Peter and James and John, the, the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, who got some extra intimate time with him, got to see things and hear things and experience things that the rest did not. They're standing there with everybody else like this. Jesus disappeared, and they're just standing there. And I can imagine Peter leaning over to John and going, John, what just happened? <laughs> and John going, you saw what I see, saw. What do you think just happened? <laughs> and, and here's James who's overhearing the whispers. Um, James going, did I see what I just saw? What do we do now? Did y'all see this coming? And I can imagine all three of them were going, no, we did not see this coming. And then we don't know the time frame. We just know while they were, they were gazing up into the heavens that two, Scripture says two men appeared. We won't think they were angels, and that's fine, who appeared to them, two messengers, and said, what are you doing this for? <laughs> You're not called to do this. Let that be a lesson to you. You're not called to do this. Jesus told you that he's not done. Here are your marching orders. Here are your instructions. Go back to Jerusalem and wait. And when the time comes, you will know what you're supposed to do. And so the scripture says, and they went back. So, so what are the mistakes that they're owning? I know that they're thinking in their minds. You know, in the past, we spent three years with Jesus. We got some things right, but man, did we get some things wrong. And when it came down to that final critical moment when we were with him in the garden, had just, you know, spent the evening with him eating and drinking and, and, and him giving new meaning to the Passover and telling us all kinds of things that were going to happen, when it came to the moment of crisis, we blew it. We ran off and we left him. And we will ever live with the shame 
the embarrassment of our failure in that critical moment. Uh, I don't want to make the same mistake over again. And the way you do that is by owning the mistakes. There, there are two kinds of mistakes, and, and, I, and I can well imagine that they exist to hear. First are, are hearing mistakes. There are hearing mistakes that all of us make. A hearing mistake is that because we operate with paradigms, they're how we process information in life, how we, we see and we hear. Uh, there's, a, there's a paradigm blindness that prevents us from seeing something because we, ex we have certain assumptions and presumptions and preoccupations that, um, and, and it's, it forms like a, a deafness that we actually don't hear what, what has been said or what somebody has said. And I want to think a lot, a lot of times in the, in the dialogues between Jesus and his disciples, I, I think they were, they were present. He was teaching them certain things. But I don't think they were actually hearing what he said because they were projecting their own sense, their, their own sense of expectations, their own values, their own understanding of Scripture into that moment. And so they really didn't hear clearly what he said. Now, you and I both know this is a common sort of family challenge. Uh, it's, a, it's especially true between husbands and wives. And I'll go ahead and say it, women. It's especially true of husbands. While you're, you know, you're, you're talking, um, your husband is not hearing what you're saying. It's true with parents and children. It's, it's true. So, so we have hearing mistakes that we make when we actually don't hear what was said, even though we were present when the sounds were being made. The second kind of mistake is actually a, a listening mistake. And that is that, that we're hearing but we're not really listening, which means we're not, we're not taking seriously what is said. We're marginalizing it because it, it doesn't fit into our narrative. And I want to think for the disciples and Jesus for the three years lived up to this moment, right up to their failure, and then, and then he came back to life and said, it's okay, guys, we, we got this. But they had to live with the fact that they had failed along the way. And so part of, the, part of their, their living in, in this gap moment, they know what has been. They're in this moment, they're not really sure about what this is supposed to mean and how you get through this. Um, is their thinking through their minds, we don't want to add to the problem. We don't want to make the mistakes we've made in the past. There are times when Jesus was talking when we really weren't hearing, and there are times we were hearing when we really weren't listening. I couldn't help but think of this character, familiar to most of you, uh, Charlie Brown. And uh, while it, it may have been especially true of his experience with teachers, but I think it was all the adult people in his life. When you read the cartoons or you watched the, 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 the animated features on him, what did he hear when adults were talking? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what Charles Schultz had in mind by that, but I get it. You know, for Charlie Brown, he wasn't necessarily paying attention to what the adults in his life were actually saying. And I think for the disciples of Jesus, and, and for us individually, is if, if we find ourselves in a gap, if you've just experienced the loss of a loved one, uh, if you've just been through a nasty divorce, if you've just lost your job, if you've, if, if, if you've been shut in for weeks or months on end because of COVID, if you've actually had COVID and your life has been radically changed, you, you've been into a gap season. It's, it's not what normal life really is, but it's a season of life that's very real to you. And the thing is that how do you live through that and how do you make the most of it? And I think it's a great time to simply stop and, and catch your breath and to think about, what maybe you had gotten gotten right before up to this point, and especially spiritually speaking. I think the same thing is true of churches. I, I've just spent a, a month doing a, a Zoom uh, sort of webinar every Tuesday and Thursday for a couple of hours and, and with a group of other spiritual leaders walking through this process of helping churches that find themselves in a gap, if not at an absolute dead end. And, and one of the things that a part of that process is, is looking back and assessing what has been and why it has been and how did we get to where we are. It's safe to say the disciples didn't make a mistake that got them to this gap. They were living a reality, but the gap represented an unknown for them. 
they're still processing what they've just seen because they've never seen that before. And, 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 and while they kept guessing what Jesus meant by what he said, and now they hear these two messengers say this, and they're all going through their minds guessing and second guessing, for them it was important to say, let's not make any more mistakes as a part of this process. How can we benefit from this, this season, this moment, this gap in our journey? The second thing you can do, apart from owning the mistakes, is, is you can actually make careful choices. Make careful choices choices. When you're talking about spiritual things, um, you know, nothing can be important. Now, financial uh, concerns in your life, they're important. Relational concerns in your life, they're important. But nothing's more important than your spiritual life because it's about you and your relationship with God and, and who, after all, controls all the variables and elements and components of your life. It's, it's, it's the Lord. And so when you, when you say, when you own up to it, when you confess to it, when in your relationship with Him, you go, Lord, <laughs> I've gotten it wrong more times than I've gotten it right. Help me to get it right better from this point forward. Help me as I assess what has been to own that which was mine to contribute to the problem. So you make careful choices, and as we read our text, regarding where you actually process, where you actually process. Pick up on our reading in verse 12. Then they, this is the disciples, they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. It, it would be real easy to get, get sidetracked here, um, but if, if you're a student of Scripture, um, before we can even get to the where, uh, the question is, you know, exactly what is meant in this passage when it talks about a Sabbath day journey. Now, many of us have heard this for a lifetime, and I don't know what explanation if you've, you've heard. Um, but I think maybe this goes into our understanding the challenges we have in interpreting spiritual things, because it, it's actually a reference here. It didn't just say they just went back to Jerusalem. It said that they went back a, a Sabbath day journey. And so I went back to review the history of, of that expression just for information's sake, because you may be curious as well. When you go back and look at the Old Testament law, it actually said on the Sabbath day, a Sabbath day journey is that far. <laughs> don't go anywhere. You don't cook food, you don't work, you don't, you know, you set aside, you shut down life, you go, you go into essentially lockdown mode. You don't go visit with the neighbors, you don't go visit with the grandkids, you don't go on vacation, you don't go fishing. You spend a day that's set aside just simply to be still with the Lord. And so if, if the law said that a Sabbath day journey started out exactly that far, then, you know, what does it mean here? Because obviously they went from the Mount of Olives down to Jerusalem. So you go back and, and the, the scholars, the, the rabbis, the religious leaders in, in Israel's day back then, uh, they said, well, maybe that's, maybe that's just not realistic. So we're, we're going we're gonna to interpret their, their actions or, or they're trying to second guess God. They said, well, you know, if you have to do something on the Sabbath, then, then what are the limits of, of how far you should be able to go that it doesn't constitute work? Because after all, that was the objective, not to work on the Sabbath, which was in you couldn't cook, you couldn't chop wood, you couldn't, because it, it all constituted work. And so for them, they said, well, surely just walking isn't work, but how far do you have to walk before it actually becomes work? And so they went back to the book of Joshua, and they said, well, so the distance between when, when Israel was carrying the Ark of the Covenant and, and how close the people could be behind it was 2,000 was meters, uh, which essentially is 3,000 feet, which is essentially, what, three-fifths of a mile. And so that became the standard measure of how far you could legitimately walk without breaking the law by becoming work was 2,000 meters or roughly 3,000 feet. But then, but then that became a strain for them. They didn't like that. And so they said, well, it has to do with where you're staying. So if on, on the day before you go out and stash food somewhere 2,000 meters out in, in the country, then your 2,000 meters really doesn't start until you get to there. So you can get up and leave your house in the city in the morning. You can go 2,000 meters, get to your stuff, and then you can go 2,000 more meters. <laughs> the game, uh, they were politicians, evidently, because they could make the rules up as they went along. 
And then somebody reasoned that, well, you know, if, if, if you can go 4,000 meters, then you have to be able to get back home. So really, it's 8,000 meters that you can actually travel on a Sabbath day journey. Um, it, it's hair splitting stuff, but it's the kind of stuff that, that can mess you up spiritually because then it's playing games with your relationship with the Lord. So needless to say, it says they went back that Sabbath, and, and we're going to guess it was the primary measure of essentially 2,000 meters that they could go, or three-fifths of a mile. And so, but where did they go back to process this gap that they're in between where Jesus has just departed, having left instructions, and their uncertainty about what and when and who and how was going to lie ahead? And so where we process becomes critically important. It said they went back to Jerusalem. For them, if, if we want to look for a, a principle in this that will help us in, in making our choices about where to process, they went back. It wasn't obviously 500 that went back. If that's how many were out there. It was at least the 12. And there, we know there are a few others as we go forward in our text. They went back to a place that has spiritual significance or value to, to them. They went back to a place that were, they had been staying. And it says they, they went back to an upper room. Uh, we, we don't know. The scholars honestly don't know. You can read, you know, the talking, you can listen to the talking heads. You can read commentaries. They just know they went back into Jerusalem. So I, I pulled up this, this image, um, this mock-up of the ancient city of Jerusalem. They call this the lower city where you all have all these houses. And it says, and they were staying in an upper room where, where, they, where they had been staying. So they went back to a place. Now whether this was, um, and I don't actually think this is where they celebrated the supper. I think this was a separate place because they had turkey and seen the dining arrangements in facilities where the, the, the table was actually down on the floor and you had pillows that you were sitting on. And, and when they celebrated the, the, the Lord's Supper there, I don't think the room was, was that big. I don't think it was a place of lodging. So I think they, they had moved into another place of lodging. And when I looked at, at these houses and the, you know, the ancient city of Jerusalem, I didn't see anything that I, I, I felt like accommodated that. So they had to go somewhere. There was a room big enough that they could actually stay. And so they went back to a place that they had been staying during this season with Jesus following his resurrection as they were going about life. You see, picking a place that has some sort of spiritual significance is not a bad place to go when you're trying to process this season, this gap in your life. In the Old Testament for Jacob, it was at, at Bethel. It was the place that he had had an encounter with God. Um, for, for most of us, there, there is a place of spiritual significance and value to us, and, and it's not a bad place. It doesn't mean it's designated or it's specified to that, but it's a go someplace where you can sort of shut out all the distractions and the diversions of life. You can have some, some quiet downtime with the Lord, but picking a place where that can take place. I think one of the, one of the big mistakes that, that people make in, in trying to process life during this season, this gap in their lives, is to go someplace where they don't have any time to process. Where it's like to get back to work, get back busy, not have to think about what is going on when the truth of the matter is that if God is sovereign and God has orchestrated life and circumstances and men and timelines, then those gaps are something that He has a designed purpose for. And if we rush back into the businesses, busyness of our, of our lives and and we don't take time to pause, then we may miss out on what it is that God is saying. If we made a mistake before about not hearing or not listening, we may make, make a greater mistake now by not choosing a place where we can go and process. And so these, these 11, because after all Judas is no longer there, they went back to an upper room to spend some time and what unpacking everything that has happened those whispered conversations that took place up on the Mount of Olives between the three or the, the eleven or however many it was, um, they're back in a place where they can speak freely. And they can, they can talk about what they're thinking and what they're feeling and what they think the meanings and the implications of those things are. And so it's important to make those careful choices. And then to, to make careful choices regarding who you process with. 
who you process with. Now there are times when we need to process alone, but I think that there are times when we need help from trusted other believers and friends to help process. Let's pick up our reading again in verse 13. That is Peter talking about they went back a Sabbath day journey to an upper room uh, and then we resume the story. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. It was important to them they had shared not entirely all of it because there were there were there were times in the ministry of Jesus over that three years when he was not with all of the twelve. There were times when he was with a few of them. There were times when he was with all of them. So they hadn't all shared exactly all the experiences and so they, they could talk about those things that they were familiar with and then they could learn from those others about those things that they were not familiar with. And so for them in trying to, 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 to unpack what has just happened, what they have just seen, what they have just heard, how it made them feel. Uh, which is the question we said last week just really wasn't, wasn't an important question in terms of doing things, but it, it is a reality. Because um, I'm thinking in my mind, if, if you're there on that Mount of Olives and you see Jesus ascending, how is that affecting you emotionally? Do you, do you want to break down and weep because of the uncertainty or the fear or the anxiety or the whatever they may be about that? And so these Men, they go back to this upper room, this place where they're staying, to spend this time unpacking and to talk about all that is taking place. You and I both know this very well. Some of you know this better than others. And that is that the people we choose to hang with have an enormous influence on the decisions we make, the conclusions that we draw, and the actions that we take for both good and evil. Um, before a person comes to Christ, not exclusively then, but more so then, how many of you, how many of us, there are certain things that we did that we should not have done, that we, we might not have done had somebody not invited us to do those things. If, if Misery loves company. I gotta, I gotta confess you, sin really loves company. For some reason, we want somebody else to do the same wrong thing that we're doing, and somehow that makes us feel a little bit better about them doing it. So there's the power of influence in the people you choose to be around you at any given point in time, both for evil and also for good. Because how many of us have been influenced by somebody that, because of their, their, their spiritual maturity, their relationship with God, their understanding and, and familiarity with Scripture um, leaves such a profound impression on our minds and our lives. It's like we, we want to be with that person because we see God in them. We see the work of the Spirit in them and, and we so, as a believer, we so want to have that same kind of thing for us. And so who, who, are the, who are these apostles, who are these disciples going to want to spend this time processing all that's taking place other than other people who have shared spiritual value, the same sense of calling, having shared the road with Jesus for those three years. We can't make any, any more careful choices than the choice of the people we choose to spend time with in the gap between the, the last great high moment and the one that is to come. But choose carefully those people which we spend that time with. And I'm going to use this as a segue to say this is, this is where we're going to bring this in for a landing. We'll resume our journey next week simply in the interest of time. To say I know what it's like because I'm there. I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a gap in my season of life. Step down from active pastoring it's been a little over three years ago. Moved to a different place because I sensed this is where God would have me do the very kind of thing that I'm doing. Was in the middle of a transitional interim pastor experience. Preaching and teaching and walking with the people and, and, and doing all the kind of things that we're talking about here and then COVID hit. And while God was blessing and, and the Spirit was moving and people were making progress along the journey, COVID 
shut the process down, and those who didn't want that kind of future were able to rally their troops and to say, that's not what we want. We don't want a future, we want the past. We don't want the way that it can be, we want the way that it has been. And because they were able to do that, the few calling the shots called me in and said, your services are no longer welcome. Um, there are no opportunities to preach right now because churches, many of them are still not meeting. So I'm, I'm in a gap season with the rest of you. And the ministry that we're doing right now is a part of what I'm doing as an expression of the very principles that we're talking about here. Doing what God has led me to do. Picking a place. Picking the, the folks that I associate with. The group of friends. Most of them are retired pastors here. Spiritual leadership to spend time with. Processing life. And then spending a lot of time in prayer. I can't think of a better note um, on that to end today's time with you than to say that. So whatever you're going through at this moment, the gap season you're in, knowing that God is in control, God has a purpose, God is in charge, and God will bless you through this if you're careful in doing what needs to be done during this season. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, it's, it's been a little awkward today for whatever reason. Um, but I, I, just, I, I just trust that to you. Because as I read this passage and, and it just spoke to me. Because this is, this is where we are as a nation, as a world. And that you have a word for us in this. And so I want the people who share this journey to say, you don't just sit on your hands during this time. You don't spend all your time just thinking about what was. But you, you prepare yourself for what can be and what God wants to do. And so I just commit the words and the text and the passage and the image to you and those who are sharing in this journey. So Father, um, you know our prayer concerns, you know our struggles, you know what you want to do. Help us to surround ourselves with godly people as we try to make sense of the senseless. Help us find a place to be still and be quiet in order to do that. And then Father, enable us Enable us to have the best quality prayer life that we've ever known in our lives. I commit our journey to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. I was just thinking as I was praying that, that, that for me, whether it's with somebody else, which it has been, or, or it's, even it's alone, some of my best quality prayer time in a, in a gap season is to, to take a prayer walk. That is to get out someplace where there's, there's nobody to hear what I'm saying, to actually pray outside. And, and to walk as, as, though, as though you're not, but as though you're actually walking along with me and we're having a conversation. And I'm simply talking to you about the things in life, the things that I don't know, the things that I don't understand, what's going on. And just sort of to, to open up my heart and my soul to you. So let me encourage you, if you've never done that, you would do well uh, to try to experiment with a prayer walk. And if you can do it with somebody else, that's fine too, but it's one of the ways of doing that. So once again, I, 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 I want to hear from you. Uh, I, you know, how, how are we doing? If, if there are things that we can change in the process of what we're presenting to you, I, I want to hear that. If you have prayer concerns that you'd like for me to share uh, with others you know, that are viewing this, that we can, as a, as a body of believers, scattered though we may be, can, can pray for each other, I, I want to be able to do that. And then, and then pray for us in this ministry as we, as we, you know, we pray that the COVID thing and the, the lockdowns will be, would, would, would move away quickly and we can resume life. And, and I would have those opportunities to engage people in the churches um, in order to provide assistance to them. So, so pray for me and pray for this ministry as, as we work through this process. And then um, if, if you need to, if you want to reach out to me, then, you know, here is my email address on the screen for you to see. Write me a note. Find me on Facebook uh, and sh share an invite with other people. I see that that's taking place and, 
And if I've not met you yet, then, you know, the Lord willing, one of these days we can do that. We may even want to try to, to, to plan some sort of a, a, a group online meeting to where we can pick a day and a time to say, okay, let's just all log on and let's look at each other and talk and pray and encourage each other. Let's just do what, what the Lord would lead us to do to make this happen. And also, if you would like to support this ministry, it, it would be much appreciated. The, the, the resources would simply go into furthering the cause of helping God's people wherever they might be to achieve what, what God would have for them to achieve. Uh, in the meantime, God bless you. Thank you for the privilege and the honor of sharing this experience together. Next week, we will pick up, do a brief recap, and resume our journey in Acts chapter 1. Have an awesome life.